classrooms across the country, she had that same textbook. It wasn't an Afrocentric textbook. It was a Eurocentric textbook. But because Audra was clear on where she is in the war, she was able to use the Eurocentric textbook to teach her children, who were all black, information they needed to know so that they could learn. Because curriculum is not about pieces of paper that you follow. Curriculum is inside of you. You deliver curriculum to people based upon what your training is. So when you get finished at Howard, if the curriculum that resides in you is a Eurocentric curriculum that has no African information, that has no tie back to African culture, and you're not in the process of re-Africanization, you will become a liability for us. It is up to you to educate and train yourself to know what you need to know so that you can be in the war and on our side. And I'm not saying this to incite anybody. However, if we have world peace right now, the only beneficiary of world peace is the people that won the last war. So if we can get the college students and the normal warriors in our stuff focused on everything except war, be it playing cards, smoking weed, constantly having sex, and trying to get a job and be quote unquote successful, then the, 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 then the oppressor doesn't have to worry about what you're going to do. You're fighting on their side. I'll end it there. One more time, that was Dr. Kenneth Shockley, uh, Professor Morgan State University. Now, to contextualize what we've seen here, we have about, uh, we're going to go to, to 4 o'clock on this panel, because we started a little late. So we have about 15, 14, 15 minutes for questions and answers. This panel was directed to, we're going to come to you, Queen, I see you over there. We're going to contextualize what's been said in a South American context now, in a Central American context. So all that you've seen here as far as uh, institutions and how to teach African-centered education, the psychological parameters of what it really means to be an African person and what we should be thinking as African peoples throughout the diaspora. And indeed, the curricula that we should be creating for our own communities and advancement and future development, they have none of this down in the majority of the places where black people will work to in this hemisphere. We're up here with 5%. And so in the back you can see these individuals who are speaking different languages, European languages. Uh, there's black South Americans here from Colombia and uh, there's one or two black Central Americans maybe from Panama. What we're talking about is that new infusion of African centered or uh, African diasporan students at Howard and in other institutions that are historically black in the United States and creating those institutions in Brazil, in Venezuela, in Colombia, these huge black population centers that exist today. So the panel was to see what we need to be teaching first and then we go to the next stage and understand how to develop those in these southern countries. So I wanted to make sure that y'all understood the context of what was going on here. I happened to have taught in an HBC in Colombia, South America, for four years. What was I teaching, English? No, I wasn't teaching English at all. I was teaching African diaspora history. And we were teaching African history. We were teaching the experiences of African persons throughout the diaspora. We were teaching ancient African history, exactly what needs to happen. So when y'all ask your questions, cater them to what you've heard and maybe what we could or should be doing. I'm gonna open the floor this time for, for questions. Uh, we have one over here in our first round. Any more questions? Two right here. More questions on the first round. Three, four, five. Okay, we're going to order. Remember your number, please. First up. Thank you. 
So why not five countries, why not five continents? Like our focus on Africa itself takes away our focus of what we are and who we are in the world. Secondly, the land has a name for itself. And until we learn how to call the land by its name, we won't learn how to communicate with the land. So in the discussion of talking about what sovereignty is, African people around the globe, first of all, Europeans haven't been able to define themselves as, as people yet. The way that Africans describe ourselves as people is very different than how Europeans describe people. There are folks that bury their umbilical cords, placenta, uh, at birth in the land to say that we are birthed from the land. There are people that define and describe themselves as coming up from the land. Literally, we were born out of the earth. And then in death, they are buried back into the earth. The mother is the womb, the mother is the garden, we grow, we die, we return to the earth. These are very different conversations. So when we talk about African people, I don't want to just focus on one continent, but one idea of how we exist and coexist in the world. We do know that existence under European Arab conditions is non-existence for African people. I'm very interested about what you said about uh, post-traumatic slavery syndrome. But my question is, uh, how to be an African? Because all what we know now is what the Western used to do for the Africans. But nobody learned us how to become Africans. No, because we just learned how to become Western no, but not Africa. In the time, we were Africans. But now, the only thing we have is our color and our mentality as Africans. But nobody can us how to do So, thank you very much for that question. Um, brother, one second, we have an announcement. This is, uh, after the session is over, we have an announcement. So, don't you mind going away that you can uh, hold up. Did you, uh, you want to respond to that? Sure. Okay. And, and all of us could respond to that in different ways and similar ways. So thank you very much for that question. How do we be African? There's, there's just a few things that would allow us to start that process of re-Africanization. Right? The one thing is connecting with people in harmonious ways. So looking to establish collaborative relationships between people so that we relate to each other as people is first. The second piece is honoring the ancestors who provided for healthy living of African people. We give them two things now, we can re-Africanize ourselves. So if we forgot everything in the world, there's one thing that we would know is that people came before us. And since there are people that came, that came before us, we know those folks are our connection. So the question then becomes how far, and I think Brother Kemet um, articulated this lively, Right? not just academically, living. If we expand our understanding of history back into time and perpetuity, we will understand who we are as source people. And that's where I say that connection to the land is real key. So then it comes into what are our agricultural systems? How do we honor women? How do we honor children? Those basic things will start to define what healthy living is for African people. Right? So there are, there are a number of things that we can pull out. There's some basic things like agricultural systems that we can be sedentary in the environments that we live in. So the question of how do we become African, those Africans that I described in Suriname never lost any of the things that they brought with them. And they are fighting now to retain them in Suriname under the threat of globalization, under the threat of the younger generations wanting to experience the urban life. Right? The other piece I would say is go to war. Like physically, we need to go to war. We have war being waged upon us. I don't know if we are physically in the war yet. You ever see somebody get slapped up and they just don't respond? They're not in a fight, they're getting beat up. We haven't yet talked about what the resistance looks like in this moment. And you know, with time permitting, and this will be an ongoing conversation, so hopefully we can continue. Can I just add a little to the, 
I, I think we really, the Western education tries to convince us that we're not African. But we're more African than we can possibly imagine. The stuff we're doing is still very African. Every time a sister is like, I'm gonna go to the bathroom and brings four or five other sisters with her, that's very African. Right? When, uh, when we do, when women, have you ever seen women, it's called an embongi in, in the Congo, but when women do each other's hair, that's extremely African. How they talk to each other, how they relate to each other, that's very African. We're people of rhythm, we're people of timing. We still have that rhythm and timing. We're people of great stories. We still have those great stories. We've been trying to convince ourselves, like Malcolm used to tell us, it's like, we're trying to convince ourselves that we're more American than we are African, but we can't hide it. It's just like somebody who wants to perm their hair. A couple, two weeks, Africa will come right back up in there, right in the front and in the back. You can't get rid of Africa. Africa is what makes you beautiful, it's what makes you strong. If you read, I keep throwing books out here because I know y'all look like some readers, right? And I tell my students, readers are leaders and leaders are readers. But check out the book by Shek Anta Dia.
So we're living now because we need to live. Otherwise, I will put it like <laughs> We need to live. Just what I can say. So thank you very much for your assistance, but it's not done. We have to go to the conference session. I repeat again, auditorium downstairs, local 340 and local 300. Thank you to my friend. I don't know if he, he told you about his nickname. He's Santiago. A round of applause for Santiago. <laughs> So for uh, those of y'all who are going over to Lock Hall, myself, I've been uh, asked to come over there as well. Uh, we continue this conversation for the rest of the evening. We're here Thursday, uh, we're here Friday as well. Those of y'all who need information uh, about the presentations that we're giving today, please be sure to come and speak with our presenters. I'll make myself available for another 10, 15 minutes as well so we can uh, exchange ideas. Thank y'all for coming. No, again, again. My